Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter number 3. Our text verses will be verses number 1 through 10, and the message for today is entitled, The Angel of God Visits Moses. Uh, We're in a series entitled, Encounters with angels. Uh, The angel of the Lord visits Moses. Exodus chapter number three, beginning with verse number one. The Bible said, now Moses kept the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. For I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and and large unto a land flowing with milk and honey and the place unto the place of the Canaanites and uh, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore... And I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great Sunday school day service and our great teaching staff. Uh, Lord, we're so blessed at MBC, blessed with the best and Thank you uh, for them and for all of the people that's come today, this great attendance at the Lord's house, our first-time guests and our returning guests and our loved ones. And and may, Lord, this be a time of of touching hearts and challenging lives and a a time of, of commitment from your people. Anyone that might be unsaved that does not have the assurance that should they die today that uh, they would be welcomed into heaven. God help them to decide for Christ uh, at this time. And Lord, 
We uh, are thankful for those that have experienced successful surgery uh, for Brother Tony and that victory and uh, that he'll be getting out of the hospital uh, even maybe even today or tomorrow. And the Lord, we're praying for Jerry as he goes in for his extensive surgery uh, tomorrow for uh, another great report of victorious surgery. And all the others that are sick, we pray for, help us to learn from today's visit with the angel. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the fourth in a series of messages on encounters with angels. On this particular occasion, the angel of God visits Moses. We're first introduced to Moses, as you might already know, in chapter number two. He was born at a time when Israel was enslaved to Egypt. And during the time when uh, Pharaoh was putting to death all the male babies being born, Moses' mom, of course, could not bear uh, to see her, her baby boy Killed, So she hid him for three months, and which was inevitable. When she could no longer hide him, uh, she made a, a box of, of bulrushes. She waterproofed. To, uh, that box and, and she put little Moses inside and sent him floating uh, close to the bank downstream into the midst of several Egyptian ladies who were there bathing that day and uh, uh Little Moses uh, cried out at just the exact time. And, and Pharaoh's own daughter uh, heard him, waded out to the little ark of bulrushes, opened the lid, and, and instantly fell in love with Moses. And uh, chose at that instant to adopt him and raise him as an Egyptian. And what's even more uh, miraculous is that uh, Moses' sister, his older sister Miriam, had been charged to walk along the bank of the river and keep an eye on Moses to see what would happen to him and uh, and uh, uh, as she uh, sees what's, what's happening to him, uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter says, we need someone to nurse this baby. And uh, Miriam was on hand and said, I know a lady that would be perfect for that job. And she goes and gets Moses' own dear mom. And Moses... Uh, nurses at the breast of his natural mom until he is weaned, uh, but he is raised as an Egyptian and, and because of his uh, standing and stature uh, with the royal family, he is actually in line to one day become Pharaoh of Egypt. He's there for 40 years. And uh, after 40 years, it came into his heart uh, to visit his, his, his brethren, uh, the Israelites, because he had, he had been told 
his true identity and his true nationality by his mom and and perhaps other caring adults. And he went out and he saw how that they were being mistreated in slavery. And he, he sees an Egyptian cruelly beating uh, one of those Israelites and, and he tries to get him to stop, but the Egyptian will not stop and Moses is forced to actually kill him. And uh, then another day or so passes and he goes out to visit his brethren again and he sees uh, two of the Israelites struggling and arguing and fighting among themselves and he tried to break up the fight and he discovered that they had witnessed uh, the slaying of the Egyptians and they said well uh, will you kill one of us like you did the Egyptian and Moses at that point fled by faith into uh, Midian. And uh, that's uh, the story of Moses. And uh, uh, of course, he's in uh, now in this wilderness area, so to speak, for 40 more years. And that brings us to the text before us today. He's a shepherd guarding his father-in-law's flocks. And one day he notices nearby a bush that has burst into flames. And what's very unusual about this is that the bush isn't burned up like stubble should be. It just keeps burning. So in interest, he turns aside and walks up to see uh, what it is that keeps fueling this this bush. And uh, the angel of the Lord speaks from the bush and said, Stop right there, Moses. Pull your shoes off, for you are in, on holy ground. And, of course, he commissions Moses to be the great deliverer of of Egypt or of Israel from Egypt. Now, over that background, here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. The angel of the Lord on this occasion visits Moses, and here's my 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 first point to the, to the message. The angel of the Lord visits Moses. After, please underscore that, after the involvement of other people in spiritual matters. Secondly, you'll notice in the story that the the angel of God stirred an interest in Moses that prompted him to turn aside and walk up to the bush. And then lastly, uh, in the story before us, uh, we are informed of God's holiness. His holiness in person and his holiness in his will. It's an interesting encounter with an angel. But I want you to focus on this just for a moment. This angel visits Moses after the involvement of others in spiritual matters. You'll see this as you read the chapter in verses number 7 and 9. And and you'll you'll remember hearing me read. uh, The Bible said, The Lord said, I've seen the affliction of my people down in Egypt, and I have heard their cry. The people of Egypt weren't only slavishly working from dawn to dust. Uh, They were 
praying to God with every swing of the sickle and every tie of the bundled straw, they were, they were praying. And, and I, here's what I want you to understand. Uh, for a very long time, for generations really, they, they prayed and, and God visits Moses to make him the great deliverer of, of the nation after the involvement of others in spiritual things. Listen, friends, if we want a visitation from God uh, to our, our children, our families, our, our friends, our nation, we must get involved in, in, in praying and in practicing our, our faith. Life might not be pleasant with us. We may have more than our share of troubles and, and trials, but as we swing the sickle, God, I'm so weary with this slavery and bondage. I'm in. Would you please send the promise deliver? Would you please, please, please? As they tied the straw together but the mixture with it God please send the deliverer they were involved you know I think you'll agree with me one of the curses uh, in our In Christianity, if I could put it that way today, is the massive lack of involvement in spiritual things. What is our prayer life? Do we pray? I mean more than table grace. Are we weary? With the curse of our, our flesh and the sorrow of sin to where we cry out to God. And there's involvement of Moses' mom. You'll find that uh, in, in chapter number two. And it's so interesting in Moses' family, his dad isn't emphasized, but his mom is. Is his dad's own hand? She, he, (laughs) helped produce Moses. But but his dad's not emphasized in the story too much. But his mom is. And, uh, Oh, how mom loves little Moses. And she knows the danger into the day in which he is born into. And if you'll read chapter 2, I challenge you, you'll check a reoccurring word that's only three uh, letters long. She. She. She, 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 she. And there's another lady on hand, and she's a young girl, perhaps preteen or teen age, Miriam, walking alongside of the river, wanting to see how God answered their prayer concerning Moses. And Lord, let little brother, let him steal the hearts of one of those 
uh, Egyptian ladies. And my, uh, as the Bible said, God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we, that we hope for, that we, that we think because it just wouldn't just any of the Egyptian ladies whose hearts, uh, and the little Moses stuff. It was the Pharaoh's daughter herself. The involvement of the she's. Gentlemen, let me say this to you and to I, your pastor, as a he. Oh my. If we had come alongside the she's as spiritual leaders, real spiritual leaders in our home, what a difference could be made in our families, in our, among our friends, in our nation. If the he's would join the she's. Involvement. I think today I could take up way too much time. Do you mind if I preach five or ten minutes longer today than normal? I will blame it on the activities. I'm going to blame it on the Sunday school teachers. It's their fault. I had to honor them. Uh, Think of the involvement, consistent involvement, year in, year out, involvement of the Sunday school staff. Sister Deb, honey, you and I are getting old together. Jerry, you're probably the longest involved uh, in, in the Sunday school staff, and after you, uh, Bill, probably, and, 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 and listen, Thank God for involvement week after week, month after month, year after year. Involvement. I mean, they didn't get in and didn't get out. They didn't use God like a saloon door, swing in a little while, uh, swing out. Uh, they got in and, and stayed in. Can I get an amen right there? Or is the book of Revelation coming to play today where it said, and there was silence in heaven? Listen, if you're going to do anything for God, let Pastor Rain just tell you this. It takes a while to get it done. Do you ever stop thinking about we only get 52 shots at the devil a year? That's all. But you know what I'm talking about. Basically, 52 shots is the devil. And the devil gets the rest of the shots. Over 300 of them in a year's time. Uh, if you want to do anything for God, you just get in, get planted, stay planted. When the devil tries up, root you, say, No, devil! Think, I'm thinking all these kids up here today, all the teens and the countless ones that have gone on before them, the lives, countless lives that Sunday school staff have, have changed. It will be worth it over yonder. Everything you've done It'll be worth it. Just hang in there. Uh, Listen, God does something in the story to stir the entrance of Moses. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. He's out there doing what he does every day. He's taking care of the sheep. 
and uh, he's give up uh, the pleasures of sin in Egypt <laughs> to be out there as a shepherd uh, over his daddy-in-law's sheep. And uh, uh, notice, if you will, when God uh, appeared to Moses in this burning bush, Moses said in verses number two and three to himself, he said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Moses got interested in this bush, why it didn't burn up just kept on burning different from stubble. And uh, God's people have been actively praying and faithfully uh, praying with every swing of the sickle. And now God stirs interest of a shepherd man with a staff in his hand. Uh, you know, God will do something to stir the interest in some people and they will turn aside to see what's going on. Uh, let me illustrate that just in a couple of points. You've heard me reference it before. I love it. Um, you know, the song, uh, I don't even remember the name of it now, uh, but the, in the song, the songwriter said, uh, well, you know, this, that, and the other. We're just living our regular lives. But he said, it, 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 it's just come upon our hearts. And I said, why don't we go down to the all days meeting and dinner on the ground? They probably just went down there to get the food. You can tell they made a good Baptist, but they just went down there to get the food. They just went down there all days meeting dinner on the ground, hear the singing. Uh, he just went down, and the song said, something got a hold of me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Something got a hold of me. When Moses got interested in why that bush didn't burn that unique situation, he turned aside. God got a hold of him. You heard the story about a fellow lived in the community of the church. Never would go to church. And the people didn't even invite him. It's like a lot of people today that never invite nobody to church. I know you're not like that. You invite people every week, don't you? Don't answer that. But anyway, went on for years. <laughs> the church house caught on fire. One of the, that's a hillbilly word for fire. Uh, caught on fire. And uh, one of the first ones to come over to, to throw water on and try to uh, put the uh, fire out at the church was that neighbor that never did come to church. Hadn't even been invited to church. People didn't care much whether anybody might come or not. And uh, one of them said to us and said, man, said, uh, uh, you, you've lived around here for years. Ha- why is it you've never come to church before? And he said, I've never seen the church on fire before. <laughs> so he come help put the fire out. You, you, you know, I, I just wonder if God see churches get on, if, if people see churches get on fire, they'd come down and see what's going on. And, uh, uh, come help you out. But we need to see the church on, on fire. Uh, John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus met that woman at the well 
And man changed her life, gave her salvation, forgave her of all of her sins. And, and she went into the community. And she said, come see a man that told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And the Bible said a lot of them people from that area came over to see Jesus this, uh, because of that woman's word. And then it even said some of them came over and they said, the woman said, we've come over here uh, not because of, uh, of your work, but because we want to see it for ourselves. So God has a way of, of, of stirring an interest in some people's hearts. One here and one there. He can get all the fellows out there fooled with the, the sheep and all the people working in that area, but he got a hold of Moses' heart. And I'll tell you what, when God gets a hold of one heart, he can deliver a multitude of people by one heart. The story informs us of God's holiness. I won't be much longer. I'll wrap the service up in just a few moments. But I want you to notice something. Here comes Moses. He's coming up to the bush. That thing's burning. He's coming up there. He's getting pretty close. He's as close to the bush as he can get for the flame warms him too much uh, to where he has to back off. He's getting up there pretty close, and, and the angel of the Lord speaks to him out of that burning bush and said, stay right where you're at, Moses. Come a little closer till you pull off your shoes because you, my shepherd friend, is on holy ground. You are on holy ground. And Moses reached down and pulled his shoes off. And God called him and commissioned him to be the great deliverer of, of Israel. And his story begins. But I want to focus with you and please focus with me just in, a, in the few closing moments on, on this. When we come into the presence of God for worship and learning, we do need to realize this. We are on holy ground. And that demands a certain respect and reverence. We need to respect the holiness of God. Uh, now, I'm not going to jump on anybody at all, but our attitude about worship is very important. Well, that preacher didn't do a thing for me today, blah, blah, blah. An old friend of mine up in his 80s, uh, pastor, missionary, work, and a lot of things. He said one time, and never will forget it, uh, you know, somebody told him after church one day, he said, Pastor, so I'll just be honest with you, I didn't get a thing out of church today. And the old preacher said, well, did you bring anything to get something in? <laughs> <laughs> we need to come before God with the right attitude. You know, uh, I'm going to get a bunch of, of, of fault finder permits. I'm going to have them printed up and uh, I'm going to issue them to everybody that wants one. Uh, but uh, let me tell you something. Your attitude has a lot to do with what God's going to do in your life or whether he'll do anything in your life. You've got to open your heart. You've got to open your mind. You've got to obey the Lord. You've got to realize. Listen, and then our actions, you, you know. Well, I ain't going to pull my shoes off. Bless God. That pastor, I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to wear these moccasins. You 
No, he didn't argue with God. He just reached down and pulled his shoes off. Because God told him to. You know why you ought to do some things? Because God told you to. Don't matter how you feel about it or what you think about it or how you would do it. It's, it's what God says. And, uh, you know, that brings me to this next point. I, uh, <clears throat> I made a uh, social media post some time ago about the wholeness of God and how I had seen things change in my uh, 45 year uh, ministry and, and pastorate and how uh, the dress and, and the attire and the attitude and the things in churches had just changed drastically. It just changed. You know, used to, you could, you could tell a preacher, uh, well, the way he dressed. And uh, all, all those days are, are changing and, and, and stuff. Anyway, I made a post. You know, I, I'm one of them fellows. I, I still like it when a, if a fellow preaches in my pulpit, uh, I know a tie ain't got nothing to do with anything. But that's the way we do it around here. If you want to preach, you wear a tie. I don't want you in some pullover polio I don't want you in some Levi's cut here and there. Or, uh, you know, when we was a kid down in the hillbilly country, we went through a silly phase. Sis might remember this. Us boys was kind of, I started to say stupid. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but I'd say it was, it was just kind of not all together mentally. And we'd buy these Levi's, and the first thing we'd do is get mom, we called it pegging them. And we'd peg them Levi's so daggone tight down here. You couldn't hardly get them on. Sis, you remember them peg Levi's? And then you get a white T-shirt, and if you had a pack of Winston's, you roll them up in, the, in your sleeve. Does anybody remember that? Is anybody old as I am? Now, you got little business, in my opinion, representing the king of kings. <laughs> looking like somebody singing on stage in a bar. Will my attendance increase next week? Anyway, this fella, this fella replied, and he was nice, and his premise was this. He said, well, you got to remember uh, our God is also our dad. That's what he called God, dad. Now, I realize that's okay. and You could call dad if you want to, but I call my dad dad, but I don't know if I want to call dad, God dad or not. Just something about that don't, don't sit with me too good. Uh, I'd rather stick with Holy Father. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's always got to remember, when I go to church, I go to see my dad and my dad just like Murphy, Dad, don't care how I dress. He's glad to see me. So I replied, I was nice as pie. I was so kind. But I got 45 years experience of watching snowballs roll downhill. So I told him, I said, well, I understand that. God is our dad. You can go on down there and see your dad if you want to like that. But let me tell you something about my dad. I loved my dad. And I honored my daddy. And if my daddy was a king, amen, if my daddy was a prince, if my daddy was almighty God, I'd respect my daddy more than I would anybody's daddy. I'd say because my dad's a king, I'm not going to dare to show up looking like a vagabond by choice. Not not because, uh, listen, you, mom always told us, uh, my sister was that, mommy always said, whatever you, where are you best to the Lord's house? That's what them hillbilly Christians told me. Are you getting mad at me yet? Is anybody getting mad at me yet? I'm going to go hide somewhere. 
He get mad at me yet. But listen, that's all the more reason for us to keep the house of God holy and above the world is because dad, our dad is king. Man, he got on them royal garments. Ha <laughs> ha! He got on them royal garments. And here comes his kids, princes. I never will forget. Uh, I, this is fun. This will be worth staying five minutes longer for me to tell you this story. Now, when Melanie and Scott was courting, Melanie went out one time. I think it was for Scott's birthday or something. Bought him some clothes. And I'm just telling you this for the first time after all these years. I hope you don't fight after church over it. <laughs> but Faye and I laughed so much about it. Scott didn't like that outfit. I don't know what he told you. If he had been smart like I raised my boys to be, he said, honey, I love it. <laughs> but but he, anyway, <laughs> any, anyway, he, he liked that. He said, that made me look like Prince Charles' his boy. <laughs> you get my point? Prince Charles' his boy dresses a little different when he's on royal business. Now, you can do what you want to, but when I'm on royal business, I like to represent my Lord best I can. Amen. I'll be preaching here next Sunday. (laughs) If you'd like to come back. (laughs) But even if you don't, I'll love you, and if you have a need in your life or you sense a death angel coming or there's a need in your family. You call old preacher Reigns and I won't come preachy. Uh, I, I won't come judgmental. I'll come with my heart in my hand and I'll love you and do everything I can to help you. Just as I am without one plea, that's for the sinner man. That's for the fellow that's lost. And they're always, no matter how people come around here, they're to be loved and treated right. And they better be, or you will raise the ire of Pastor Reigns if you look down on or say bad things about anybody. Uh, but let me, let me, let me tell you something. God is holy. Those seraphim, Isaiah 6, you know what they did all day long? They cried, holy, holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Now I'll tell you, when you give your best to God, God will do better than you best. But I thank God. I think God deserves a lot more than what the world's given Him today. I think God deserves a lot more than what our churches are giving Him today. You go visit your dad. I know he loves you any way you want to. But if my dad is the king, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make my daddy, I'm not going to make a tear come down his cheek by saying, son, you didn't even, you knew I was on royal business. I'm done preaching. Let's stand.